Coming up next, Sitting at 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is made possible in part by TCI and is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Good afternoon. I'm Lloyd Anderson, president of the club. Welcome to another special program. Today we'll talk about the Portland Art Museum and the work that our speakers have, have been doing at the Art Museum during the, the five years that they've been here. We'll also get a preview of the upcoming Stroganoff exhibit. Friday uh, next week on November the 5th, join us uh, at, at the Molten Athletic Club when we'll hear from Jack Roberts, Oregon Commissioner of Labor and Industries, on our Oregon workers benefiting from Oregon's economy. Next week's program will begin at noon so that we can discuss and vote on the City Club report, Increasing Density in Portland. Again, we'll refer, uh, uh, go back to our regular location at the Molten Athletic Club. The Growth Management and Environment Committee and the Portland Bureau of Environmental Services are coordinating a tour of sites relevant to the endangered fish in, in Portland on Saturday, November the 13th. It'll be from 9 a.m. till noon. Space is limited, so if you'd like reservations, please call Winnie at the City Club. The annual fund goes on. Our goal is $100,000, so uh, write your check uh, today if you can or as early as possible. Our board host today seated at the head table is Susan Deskamp, member of the Board of Governors. She will ask the first question of our speaker. Following Susan's question, we will open the program to questions from City Club members. You have cards on your table if you are too shy to come up to the microphone and ask a question or for whatever other reason you don't like want to, then uh, feel free to write uh, uh, on uh, the card and raise your hand and a staff member will bring the card up to Susan. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Providence Health Plans, U.S. Bank, and Washington Mutual Savings Bank. We're very grateful for their support. If you were to ask someone in Portland five years ago, what came to mind when the word arts was used? Probably Senator Jesse Helms and the National Endowment for the Arts would come to mind. But more recently, it might be Portland Art Museum, although I'm sure Mayor uh, Giuliani may be a close second. The Portland Art Museum has had a dramatic rebirth in the last five years, much of it attributable to the energy and talent of Lucy and John Buchanan. The capital campaign that included the renovation of the Belusky Building and the installation of climate control enabled the museum to attract national and international exhibits to Portland. The Imperial Tombs of China exhibit attracted the highest attendance of an exhibition in the history of the museum. And they've continued to attract other significant exhibits as well. Membership has trebled from 5,700 to over 18,000 and the revenue picture has improved dramatically. As some wag said, money is the source of all good. <laughs> the growth of the endowment from 9.1 million to over 34 million and the retirement of a, a, a million four of outstanding debt is a refreshing sign of a lot of good being accomplished at the Art Museum. Our, our speakers today are going to tell us about the museum and where it's headed. 
John Buchanan is a native of Nashville. He did his undergraduate work at the, the, South, the University of, of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee, and his master's from Vanderbilt. He pursued postgraduate studies at Oxford University in England, George Washington University, and the Smithsonian Institution. Lucy is a graduate with honors from Vanderbilt in science mathematics. Her career has been focused on development, membership, marketing, public relations, special events. I was pleased to see in her resume that she works closely with the executive director. We're pleased to be here at the Art Museum and to welcome the Buchanans as our speakers. John? I am so happy to see everyone here today. We are delighted for you to be with us. Uh, Lucy and I are so proud of the Portland Art Museum. It has really been a terrific five years for us. And actually, it's hard for me to believe uh, that so much time has gone by since I spoke to this group last. I am here, however, to say if you thought the last five years was good, the next 12 months is going to be really the most exciting, the most important, and the most significant in the history of the Portland Art Museum. Uh, as Lloyd said, I addressed this group back in August of 1994. And yes, I did feel like a young grasshopper who had just moved from uh, Memphis, Tennessee to Portland, Oregon and trying to figure out where I was. And now I know. Lloyd said, how do you like Portland, John? And I said, I'm incredibly spoiled uh, by living in Portland. The beauty, the assets, the resources, but most of all, the people who live here who make this city great and who have assisted Lucy and me in really galvanizing and catapulting forward the Portland Art Museum. I cannot thank the people of this town enough. Uh, I particularly want to thank the staff, the volunteers, and the trustees of the Portland Art Museum. Uh, our business here is very labor intensive. It is about people working with people and performing and lending their skill, their expertise, and their talents to all of us in the community for the arts. And so I want to uh, commend and recognize our staff. We have a staff of about 150 persons here at the Portland Art Museum. Many of them are here today, and I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart. I also want to thank all of you in the audience who are volunteers for the museum. We have a cadre of over 700 people who help us in all respects, from working in our development office, to working in our front desk, to helping us with our special exhibitions, to being docents and conveying the broad educational message that we are trying to put forward. And I thank you, volunteers. And in particular, I want to thank two, three, I should say, volunteers who are here with me today. Two of them are trustees of the museum, Phil Bogue and Pete Mark. Those are two of the people who actually brought me to Portland. Uh, Pete was the chairman of our search committee who found me deep in the heart of the South. And Phil Bogue was at the time the interim director of the museum. So I have great respect for him, uh, knowing now what I know and having uh, sat in his chair for five years. So I thank Phil and Pete and also their wives, Sue Bogue, a great collector, uh, volunteer at the museum, and Mary Mark, uh, who has been instrumental in assisting the museum in its project for the millennium. As Lloyd says, so much has happened in the interim since 1994. Yes, we did renovate the building next door. Yes, we worked on the room in which we are now seated. Uh, we had a number of very special exhibitions that allowed us to create educational programs and marketing programs that enabled the museum to wrap its arms around a broad public, not only here in Portland, but throughout Oregon and the Northwest. We increased our attendance, we increased our membership, we increased our income, and one of the most important things that we were able to do, as Lloyd mentioned, is retire the debt of the museum. 
during this past 12 months alone, and I get out my brag book just a little bit and share it with you, over 650,000 persons were served by one or more programs of the Portland Art Museum, including 60,000 school children who came for one or more of our special exhibitions, which included a late Monet exhibition, a contemporary art exhibition by Robert Colescott, uh, an Escher print exhibition, and our Down from the Shimmering Skies exhibition devoted to the art of the Northwest Coast. Also in 1998 and 99, our fabulous Northwest Film Center presented more than 300 films to over 60,000 persons with 41 visiting artists and lecturers. And you know that we have a film school attached to the film center and a filmmaker in the school's program, really one of the strongest, uh, deepest educational programs that we put forward, which reached 1,500 students. In fact, the film center of the Portland Art Museum uh, has achieved such a status that it was recognized by the Oregon Arts Commission with a governor's award for the arts this past spring. I also hope for those of you who are film goers like I am that you have found our temporary locale down at the Guild Theater. That's the temporary headquarters as we build and prepare a new theater auditorium that will open in February 2000. Despite uh, our dust and the inconvenience caused by our current construction program, and that's called the Project for the Millennium. Everyone on our staff and on our board has worked hard to try to keep their eye on the ball. And that primarily this past summer and fall has been the rolling out, the permanent installations of the art collections of the Portland Art Museum. And I will remind all of you, and perhaps tell some of you for the first time, that our project for the millennium, which is a 60,000 square foot capital expansion, has several objectives. The number one objective has been more gallery space for the museum's own art collections in all areas, from antiquities to the most contemporary art. Uh, perhaps the most telling way that I can describe this is to say that the museum has not had a new gallery for its permanent collection since 1938. Yet, the 30,000 plus works of art that we have in our collection have come since 1945. So you can imagine what we have jammed and tucked and crammed into every nook and cranny basement and attic that we have at the Portland Art Museum. Our other objectives in our project for the millennium are two new special exhibition halls. Spaces where we can show exhibitions that we organize, that our curators bring from other museums in the country, or that we uh, participate in with international uh, exchanges. And I will talk more about that later. In addition to the new exhibition halls, we are currently building, with the help of PGE Enron, a new public education center, as well as a new auditorium that I mentioned. We'll also have new visitor services, a new museum shop, a new cafe, new restrooms on every floor of the building, plenty of places to sit, plenty of places to put your coats, and those kind of amenities that make our visitor's experience to the Portland Art Museum as seamless and nice as we can make it. Then next summer, we will open for you centers for Native American art and centers for Northwest art as well as a new 15,000 square foot outdoor sculpture garden that will be located between this building, the North Wing, and the Belusky Museum building. I do hope all of you will come back to the museum or perhaps spend a few moments this afternoon uh, visiting the new installations that we put forward this August. Uh, the first phase was our galleries devoted to European paintings and sculpture. Our staff has worked very hard to identify and prepare and put on view over 300 paintings, sculptures, works of art from really 1000 BC 
through the early 20th century. It includes antiquities and paintings and decorative arts. Uh, it's an amazing romp through the museum's collections. Many of the works of art that you will see have never been on view before. Many have not been on view since, gee, 1925, 1947, 1953. And in addition to the old favorites, we have some several new very special acquisitions, including an early masterpiece that we were able to acquire this past year by Paul Cezanne, uh, an exquisite new portrait by, not new, uh, an exquisite new acquisition, a portrait by Anthony Van Dyke of the Cardinal Rivarola, a new Thomas Moran, sculpture by Carpeau, and, and many other treats and delights. I, I believe, I know, that you will enjoy these exhibitions that I've just described, as well as two more new permanent installations which we opened last weekend. And those are installations of the museum's English silver collection and an installation, a permanent installation, of the museum's American paintings and sculpture. And I'll just tell you a, a funny little thing. This gives you some insight into how granddaddies of museums like ours have operated over the past 105, 110 years. Uh, when you see our English silver collection, you will be absolutely dazzled. Uh, it is one of the three greatest in the United States. And why? Because in the 1930s, two gentlemen, a Mr. Nunn and a Mr. Cabell, said, we're collecting English silver, we're going to give it to the museum, and furthermore, we're going to give a large endowment so that the museum can continually add to its collections of English silver. Well, you can imagine in the hard times that what we really wanted was some more English silver when we haven't been able to afford the light bill, or the guards bill, or the Xerox machine bill. We had money to buy English silver. We couldn't buy German silver or French silver, or pay the curator, or have a catalog, but we could buy English silver. And by golly, we bought some. And I can't wait for you to see it, but that's just one of the beauties and the uniquenesses, uniquenesses and idiosyncrasies of museums like ours that set us apart and make us great artistic institutions. Um, I can't wait for you to see these collections and what more will come out of our vaults and out of our storage. Really, for the first time in the history of the museum, we have the opportunity to allow the museum to express itself through its art collections, and that is what we are currently involved in doing. All of this is in advance of our grand opening of the museum's new special exhibition galleries that are slated publicly for November the 21st. These will be galleries that will be devoted to traveling exhibitions so that we don't have to take down our permanent collection to do special things. And I'm proud and honored that Mary Beth Wilson Collins uh, has supported one of those galleries and Julie Newport Stott the other galleries. So uh, during the weekend of the 21st and 22nd of November, we will launch the Collins and the Stott galleries with a very special exhibition, Monet to More, the Millennium Gift of the Sara Lee Corporation, which will be sponsored for us by Fred Meyer. You may know or you may have read in the newspaper that the Sara Lee Corporation, which by the way is more than just cheesecake, it is coach leathers and Electrolux vacuum cleaners and Kiwi shoe polish and a num Hanes hose, a number of other things, also has one of the greatest corporate art collections in America. A collection of modernist paintings and sculpture for the late, from the late 19th century into the 20th century. Well, they have decided that they will give this collection away over the next year to 18 museums around the world. And Portland was very lucky that John Bryan, the CEO of Sara Lee, said, we'd love to give the Portland Art Museum a fabulous post-impressionist painting by the artist Edouard Vuillard, a painting, by the way, which is valued at about $750,000. So that's the gift from the Sara Lee Corporation to the Portland Art Museum. I said to Mr. Bryan, how about letting us show the entire collection before it's dispersed to the museums? And so John said, great, we'll put together a tour which opened at the National Gallery in Australia, is now at the North Carolina Museum of Art, 
Payne's Hosiery Land, comes to the Portland Art Museum to open and launch the Collins and Stott Galleries and goes on to its final venue at the Art Institute of Chicago. It will remain on view uh, here in Portland uh, until January 23rd, which is rather a witching hour for us, for it's about at that same time that we will bring online and begin to share with all of you and all of Portland our new education center, our new theater, our new museum shop, our cafe, all in preparation for and in conjunction with a very splendid special exhibition, really a major international cultural exchange involving the Portland Art Museum, the State Hermitage Museum, the State Russian Museum, both in St. Petersburg, as well as the Palace of Pavlos, the Academy of Fine Arts, the Russian Archives, and the museums at Solvichy Gosk. An exhibition entitled Stroganov, the Palace and Collections of a Russian Noble Family. Many of you have probably heard me speak of this, for in fact, it has been my homework uh, almost daily and nightly for the past four years, since the spring of 1996. Since that time, I have worked with Russian museum directors, curators, scholars, to identify, to research, to select, and, oh, to negotiate the loan of 250 art treasures that hold in common a Stroganov family history. Now, you would say, better known for their beef, the Stroganovs, <laughs> but I am here to tell you that they were pretty fantastic in the art department as well. Members of the Stroganov family of Russia were without a doubt the most important patrons, connoisseurs, collectors of art in Russia for over 400 years. They were not just good shoppers. They were movers and shakers. And you may know that they conquered Siberia for Ivan the Terrible and Peter the Great and were rewarded in large part for that by being given the monopoly on salt for all of Russia for 400 years. You can imagine that immense fortune. At one time, they were the wealthiest family in the world, quote Russian history books. They immediately, even in the 16th century, began to patronize artists by bringing architects to their home seat of Solvichigosk, building 32 cathedrals in this small town of the Ural Mountains by the beginning of the 18th century. They also began to collect, icon, uh, collect icons and to patronize icon painters and to do fantastic huge gold and silver religious embroideries themselves. This is all known collectively as the Stroganov School of Icon Painting. So you see that theirs is really a very thrilling artistic as well as entrepreneurial story that shaped the way Russia is today, really shaped the culture that we know as Mother Russia. By 1917, the best part of all of these collections were amassed in the Stroganov Palace in St. Petersburg. And just at the revolution, the Bolsheviks came in and confiscated everything, taking the works of art of European origin to the Hermitage Museum and the works of art of Russian origin to the Russian State Museum, where over the course of the past century, these collections have been nationalized by the Soviet government. Ours is the first project, the first exhibition in the history of Russia to examine the vast collections of the most important art collectors of that country, you will be flabbergasted. The Stroganovs had what I call the universal eye. They liked everything. Old master paintings from Botticelli through Poussin, 
the icons and liturgical objects about which I spoke, many from the famed Stroganov school, most of which have never been outside of Russia. Palace furnishings and decorative arts, including that icon of the Hermitage, the great Malachite coop that is the centerpiece of the Malachite room in the Hermitage for those of you who have visited that fabulous museum. There's Sasanian gold and silver, classical antiquities, the finest pre-Columbian objects in the Hermitage, imperial Chinese cloisonne. You'll discover and then rediscover in the exhibition both European and Russian artists made famous by the Stroganovs, including that fantastic 18th century portraitist, Madame Elisabeth Vigée Lebrun, the great portrait painter to Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, who was brought at the point of guillotine to Russia by the Stroganovs and ensconced uh, in the art community of St. Petersburg, where she went on to paint Catherine the Great and the Stroganovs and every other important mover and shaker of the 18th century in Europe. There's Hubert Robert, uh, the great French romantic painter of the 18th century, who was brought from France thereby introducing and interjecting romantic painting into Russia for the very first time. And for the Stroganovs, he, in, he painted an entire room, which we will bring from the Hermitage to Portland, Oregon. Ours is really the first project to reunite these great treasures since they were confiscated in 1917. It really gives me chill bumps every time I think about that. Because, in fact, you can imagine with the political climate of Russia that over the past century, the curators of the great museums have not been encouraged to look into the history and to the background of the collections that they maintain. But because of this project and because of the new times in Russia, they've been encouraged and they're enthusiastic. And each time I would return to Russia, I would walk down the halls of the Hermitage and a curator would put, pull me aside and say, I understand, I'll try not to do this in my Russian accent, I, I, I understand you're working on Stroganov. I have Stroganov. So it led me to the medieval department and to the porcelain department and to the arms and armor department and to the drawing department and to the Russian department. It has been incredible. I am able to do this for Portland thanks to the grace of God and to my wonderful friend, Helen de Ludinghausen, who is the last living member of the Stroganov family. Together in 1996, uh, we decided that we would investigate the possibilities of such a project. Helene uh, reclaimed her Russian roots about 15 years ago and since then has raised some enormous sums of money for the very needy Russian museums. She has established her friendship, her clout, and has loaned her world connections to the directors of those museums. And in return, she asked if John Buchanan could organize this exhibition. I'll never forget the moment when we stood for the very first time in the Malachite room of the Hermitage by the great Malachite coupe, and Helene, in her very gravelly voice, says to Mikhail Piotrovsky, the director of the Hermitage, so, Dr. Piotrovsky, will you loan the Stroganov coupe to the Portland Art Museum? No coupe, no exhibition. That was the deal breaker. And Dr. Piotrovsky, who is a world-renowned scholar, director of the largest museum in the world. I see, saw his knees shaking and said, yes, madame, of course we will loan the coupe. So I knew the exhibition was on. And Helene has been there beside me every step of the way. You'll get to meet her this winter when she comes from her place of abode, which is Paris, France, to be with us for the opening of the exhibition. I will also say that I'm deeply grateful again to Julie and Peter Stott for their early financial support of this exhibition. This has not been a small thing. And thanks to their support, it gave the project the momentum that it needed uh, to go forward. The exhibition is with us from February the 19th through May the 31st of the year 2000. And immediately following uh, its tour of duty here, I sent it on to the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, Texas. The one of the finest museums in America, and by far the greatest small art museum in America. 
I'm also lucky that after it leaves the Kimball, I'm taking the exhibition to Paris, France, to the Musée des Arts Décoratifs in the Richelieu wing of the Louvre, where it will have its Parisian appearance. And then the most thrilling for me is that the Russians are going to show the exhibition in its entirety in the special exhibition halls of the Hermitage in the spring of 2001. We are simultaneously printing the first book devoted to this topic in the world, and I'm holding the color proof that I just got sent from Japan of the cover because I can't let it go. Really a first for the Russians, a first for we in America, and a first for the Portland Art Museum. You can imagine that the educational possibilities around this exhibition are rich and immense and deep. And it's really been my goal to bring to bear as many of the disciplines of the arts and the humanities as possible so that we can really understand the history, the culture, the nature, and the art that this project yields up to us. And in fact, we have sought and have gained the input and the assistance of over two dozen other organizations in this community to create what we will style as a citywide winter fest of programs ranging from performance to lecture to demonstrations from genealogy to art collecting to chess tournaments to Cossacks to gypsies so that we can best embrace and understand what this culture is sending us and how best we can learn from it. I know at the museum alone that oftentimes what people get out of exhibitions and works of art is what they bring to them. So even now we are trying to set the context and trying to set the picture for this fantastic passage in the history of Russia by presenting this fall a lecture series. And we have information available for all of you on that sort of get ready for Russia moment. Uh, most recently, we had one of the great architectural historians, William Brumfield, speak about imperial architecture. On November the 7th, I speak more deeply about the art that is in the exhibition. Uh, Suzanne Massey will speak in January. I don't know if any of you have read her wonderful books, The Land of the Firebird, or Peter the Great, or Pavlovs, will be with us to talk about 18th and 19th century Russia. But please do uh, stay tuned to those. I in all, I, I, I go back to my first remarks in saying that it really takes a city to make a great art museum. And I want to thank all of you who have helped the museum over the past five years and longer, either as volunteers or as members or as supporters or as visitors, because we can provide all of these wonderful art opportunities, but if no one comes, it doesn't make any difference at all. You are the reason why we are doing this. Perhaps the person I need to thank the most is Lucy who I'm going to ask to come and join me and, and talk with you about some of our other opportunities and challenges and, and achievements over the past five years. This is a very unique situation in my world where a husband and wife work together. Believe me, we never planned it. Poor Lucy never gets a day off because she has to live with me and deal with me at work. So uh, she definitely has a rough road to hoe. But it's worked. And would we do this again? We don't know. Will we be doing this when we're 60? We sure don't know. But it's been a good thing for us and for the museum and for Portland just now. And I want to ask her to come forward and tell you a few of the things from the development and marketing and advertising side that I think you'd be interested in. Lucy? I also am happy to welcome you here today to the Portland Art Museum. When John and I arrived in Portland um, about five and a half years ago now, we had a great friend and patron who said to us, boy, he knew we had really ambitious plans for the development of the museum, for the development of the campus, the museum needed to be climate controlled, but he would really suggest that even though with our energy level that we go more slowly than quickly, so that we could really develop a base of support for this institution. When we first got here, 
the museum was a little stale and needed to really build its base of um, support and to broaden and deepen its audience. So today I'm really proud that as we are on the heels of this extraordinary Stroganoff exhibition and a momentous period in the Portland Art Museum as we launch our $45 million project for the millennium with 60,000 new square feet of space, I'd like to share some figures for you about where we are, some economic data, if you will. Um, and actually, uh, some of this has been mentioned. But since 1994, the museum's membership has grown extraordinarily from 5,000 household members to almost 20,000 households today, really representing about 75,000 individual subscribers to the museum. And I think there's some membership brochures out there for you, so I hope if you're not a member, now is really a good time to join. Um, museum attendance between 1997 and uh, 1998 totaled nearly 950,000 visitors. Many of them, I hope, were you and you came to see the wonderful Dale Chihuly, the Splendors of Ancient Egypt, or the Monet exhibition. Of the visitors that came to the museum, of that 950,000 people, 28.2% of these visitors came from out of state. Another 19.2% came from outside the Portland metropolitan area. And of those who lived outside of Portland, 32% stayed in the city during their trip, with 64% of those staying in a hotel, a motel, or a bed and breakfast. The Portland Art Museum, therefore, has an enormous economic impact on the city of Portland. And during this period, amounted to $88 million in the state of Oregon, with $42 million directly impacting downtown Portland. Yes, this three block uh, park block definitely can impact all of us. We've not only had a major artistic, cultural, and educational impact, but certainly a large economic one as well. The Portland Art Museum, however, is not alone in this wave of renewal. Museums across the nation are in a renaissance of attendance, financial support, capital campaigns, and renovations. Most attribute this growth to the strong economy and the rising stock market. When we started our campaign with Mary and Pete Mark helping us chair this effort, everyone said, Lucy and John, go fast, go fast, and hurry, as the stock market is still rising. The LA Times estimates that about $2 billion is currently being spent on American art museums, expansion, and renovation project. Museum boards and art community leaders are responding to the growing audiences and collections by building structures as cultural centerpieces of urban revitalization. 600 museums of all kinds have been built across the United States since 1970, according to Museum News publication. The Association of Museums estimates that 110 museums, like the Portland Art Museum, will be constructed or renovated during the next few years at a cost of some $4.3 billion. It is estimated that of these 110 museums, over half of them are art museums. Annual museum attendance nationwide is up to 565 million people, compared to a total of 188 million fans that attended all the combined major professional hockey, basketball, football, and baseball games in America in 1996. People love their art museums. Today, practically every average size community in America has a museum of some kind or description. They are as much a part of our cities as our movie theaters and our sports stadiums. Museums are major players in the world of cultural tourism and in the world of business. The impact of museum programs and special exhibitions cannot be minimized for any community. Museums are open six to seven days a week, and for our Sara Lee exhibition and Stroganoff project, we will be open seven days a week. You do not have to buy a seat to come to the museum. There is no designated curtain time that rises or closes, and usually the events, like our special exhibitions, will last for a minimum of several months. But please don't wait until the last day to come. <laughs> special exhibitions like Imperial Tombs of China and the upcoming Stroganoff are important because they help us excite first-time visitors 
and build new audience. They illuminate and educate our public. They provide opportunities to add new members, to build corporate involvement and participation, and a way in which to keep the institution at the forefront of the critical media, both locally, nationally, and internationally. And as our great friend and trustee Richard Brown stated at a recent annual meeting, for anyone inclined to be grumpy about special exhibitions, please note if successfully done, they can have a long-term beneficial and lasting impact on the museum and the permanent collections. So what happens next and how do we sustain the museum for the future? Certainly, one of our greatest priorities is building the Operating Endowment Fund. This is the lifeblood of any not-for-profit and certainly for the museum as it provides annual ongoing operating support. Ensuring the financial strength of the museum for the future is imperative, especially as we continue to see a decrease in public support for the arts in Oregon. It is notable of the $45 million we are committed to raise for the Project for the Millennium. As of today, we have not yet received $1 of public support or public monies. And in fact, in our Project for the Millennium, we are actually paying the City of Portland over $500,000 in permit fees and trolley assessments. Therefore, the growth of the endowment is how we will be able to build the museum in the future, to balance our operating budgets, to meet the financial needs of an expanded facility, and to provide new support for in innovative and creative programs, and to sustain the museum's long-term financial situation. Another future goal is the development of a long-range strategic plan for the museum's other properties. We own this building and the parking lot on the corner of Park in Maine. As we are sitting here today in the Masonic Temple, or the North Wing as we're calling it, this space provides museum offices. It houses our library, the Northwest Film Center, the Rental Sales Gallery, the Conservation Laboratory, and hosts a variety of many special events. Rental income from this building and the adjacent parking lot provide much needed income for the museum. And a strategic plan is now being formulated to plan for the best and most appropriate use of these properties in the future. Of course, new technology will continue to have a major impact on museums, many thinking it might even make museums obsolete in the future. I, along with other museum professionals, however, believe that technology will only help to grow new and enhanced audiences for museums. As we become more and more reliant on machines to do things for us, the human spirit and creativity through artistic expression becomes even more vital and important. Over the last several weeks, there have been interesting articles in the New York Times, and I'd like uh, in the Sunday New York Times Magazine recently, an article by Brian Farron was talking just about this subject. And I'd like to quote him. When the first alien spacecraft lands in Washington, DC, I want the little green people to walk first into the National Gallery of Art. I want our art to explain who and what we are before our leaders do. So as we enter the year 2000, we believe this institution, which is your art museum, will be poised to meet the challenges of the next generation and to continue to present world-class art to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. John and Lucy, um, I am just fascinated at that short span of time since 1994 and how much is going on. And I really look forward to the future. In fact, for the Winterfest, can I drag out my Dr. Zhivago hat and big wrap and okay, dress for the part. Um, recently, the New York Times reported that the Portland Art Museum has joined a consortium of USA museums to partner or cooperate with nine museums in France. I don't think this was reported in the Oregonian. Is that right? Um, to, to, to share resources and programs. So I'm curious to hear more about that because that's awfully good news for, for Portland once again. Am I on here? 
Can I be heard? Uh, in fact, I, I was just going to mention it in part of my closing remarks that uh, we are involved with a new international initiative, one of which I'm very proud. Uh, the United States Ambassador to France uh, selected nine American museums and nine French museums to come together uh, as a conference, as a colloquium in Lyon, France last week. And the point of this was to begin a working dialogue between the 18 of us in terms of sharing our own art collections and producing international exchange exhibitions. And you'll be happy to know uh, that we in Portland are working with the Minneapolis Institute of Art uh, to produce an exhibition devoted to Native American art that will travel to France uh, to three museums. And in turn, I am organizing an exhibition of French paintings that we will bring to America. Uh, ironically, I will tell you that as I met my new uh, friends and colleagues, uh, directors of nine French museums, I said, oh, would you like Native American art? Oh, would you like pre-Columbian art? Oh, would you like American paintings? Or uh, something that is uniquely us. No, what we really want is French Impressionism. And, and I said, I've got the perfect show for you, Homecoming. French Impressionism for, from American museums. So, you know, even in France. Uh, but it was a great honor for Portland, and I was tremendously thrilled to, to be involved with it. We had with us Ambassador Roatten uh, for four days, Madame Chirac for four days, uh, John Russell from the New York Times, and Alan Redding from the New York Times, in uh, correspondent in London, and that's the article to which we referred. So it's another way for the museum to bring the world to Portland and for us to participate in broadening the horizons of really all of us in this room. I'm Arnold Kogan, member of the City Club. The earlier references to the New York Times reminded me of um, the controversy going on between Mayor Giuliani and the Brooklyn Museum. And I'd be interested not so much um, in the, your insights about that controversy, but what the implications are from all that's going on there uh, for Portland Art Museum and other art museums in the country. Uh I, I'm, I've thought much about that. Uh, in fact, uh, I've never said this publicly, but I will. Uh, for months, I spoke with Arnold Lehman, the director of the Brooklyn Museum of Art, about sharing that exhibition uh, here in Portland. It's, it's interesting. I think, uh, let's say the exhibition had come here first and we had done it. I don't think that controversy would have ever actually occurred. Uh, it was an impossibility for us because the only time slot was immediately in the middle of our Russian exhibition and there was no way that I could push the Russians off. Uh, however, I will, having said that, um, I am a believer in balance, uh, uh, so I would have probably talked with our city fathers and mothers and, and my own trustees about the merit of, of such an exhibition, or any exhibition like that. Uh, I, I don't believe in censorship, however, and I do believe that we as museums have a, uh, have a challenge and, and a philosophy that we must be able to show what we consider to be um, valuable and meritorious works of art. And that's first and foremost the, the question. Uh, are the works of art on view in Brooklyn truly meritorious works of art? I can't answer that question. Uh, but I do think there has to be some balance. I, my, I talk with my colleagues in France, my American colleagues in France, about uh, the situation in Brooklyn, and we all agree that we uh, philosophically, uh, theoretically, must support the Brooklyn Museum of Art. Uh, you must. Uh, how, however, it has had some negative ramifications for some of my colleagues. One of my colleagues lost a $3 million gift because of it. His do potential donor said, we believe museums are arrogant, and we're going to retract that. However, in the next breath, he said to me, but there's just somebody else standing outside the door ready to make a similar gift. I, unfortunately, I think it'll be decided in courts, uh, which is not where any of us want to take our business, because uh, the only people who benefit from that are attorneys. <laughs> Hi, Lily Mandel, City Club member. Uh, you've 
done so much with building up the museum and we want everyone to enjoy it. So I wonder why the museum could not have an hour, a day, an evening, once a month, to open its doors free for all to visit and share the museum. I know there have been sponsors to allow uh, people in free admission, but that is not the same thing. I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, Are you really? It, it, yeah, no, I am. Oh, because I, 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 think, about, I, think, I think about it, and, and I, I, think, I think about it all the time. I mean, if, if I had my druthers, and it were a perfect world, and I were king, I would have completely free admission to the museum. However, none of those things are uh, reality. Um, you, you heard Lucy mention, we receive n virtually no public money at all. None. Well, I am sorry to interrupt you, but uh, the city was very, very generous and gave the museum a million dollars, and I think that we do deserve that, uh, the citizens here. And, so, you know, and, uh, and, and let me say that I am extremely grateful to the city of Portland for that one-time only gift. But on an ongoing basis, uh, we are looking at trying to raise over $10 million annually from private support to support the budget. And on an ongoing basis, that, that city support is simply not there for whatever reason. And uh, my hope very much is that uh, we can continue to find sponsors, usually they are corporate, to allow us to keep the museum open free of charge on some sort of basis. We certainly are hoping and dreaming that as we uh, restore the museum's collections to permanent exhibition that as we bring that online in late summer of 2000 that we will be able to provide an extended period of time that will be free of charge to all the general public but we think about it all the time we, we worry about it all the time and I appreciate you so much asking me that question you know it's, it's interesting uh, uh, how that comes about um, I, I'm so sensitive to always making sure that artists are paid and musicians are paid and of course we all buy tickets to go to the symphony and to the ballet uh, and don't think about that when uh, it comes to the museum and so I think that there's a fine balance but we do want to make it as available as we possibly can and I appreciate that that question thank you for asking me Hi, Irwin Mandel, City Club member. You presented a, a wonderful picture of the past five and a half years of the successes and contributions you've made to the city of Portland. However, you said of something about having druthers. Looking back, if you, and not, because nothing ever runs totally smoothly. Looking back, if you had your druthers, that's for each of you, what is it you would like to have done differently during this past five and a half years? Mm, what's the after you? <laughs> uh, maybe not work seven days a week. That might be a nice thing not to have to do. Um, no, certainly I think that one of the reasons that we came to Portland, and, and I would like to brag about John, um, John is really the, has had the vision for this institution, and there, you know, not everyone is 100% um, enthusiastic about everything that we've done to try to get to this institution to a better point, certainly. Uh, criticisms of blockbuster exhibitions for whatever reason. But everything really has, has been mapped out in a very logical and strategic plan to take the institution from one place to the, to the next. Um, I think that it was um, very sad to us to have to do great big exhibitions and not be able to have our collections out on view at the same time so that we could do connections and really talk about our collections as they relate to special exhibitions. So as we go forward, um, this, this institution is going to be at a better place. We're going to be able to get the collections out. We're going to have an education center. We can really begin to focus uh, raising money for scholarship dollars or whatever else we need to do. But 
when we came to Portland, this institution was really uh, destitute financially and really did not have the funds to begin to think about how we can better integrate this institution into the community. And so I think that um, it's just been one day at a time uh, with every minute counting, counting. And, and I would just say that I, I'm, because I've had to take care of so much in my own backyard, that I have not gotten to relax and enjoy Portland and the other amenities that it has to offer, including my sister cultural organizations. Uh, and I think that as the museum becomes more online with its physical plant and with its collections, that we'll have the window of time and the window will be open for us to do that. The, just, just one other thing is, because the resource, the artistic resources are so great uh, on this block of property on which we are sit, sitting, uh, I, I feel a compunction to share them not only with Portland, but also the state and the surrounding region. And I really hope that we're going to have the wherewithal and again the window of time to begin to penetrate more deeply into the state of Oregon and share the artistic resources with the community. When I first came here, within the first couple of weeks, a company came to me and said, we'd like to give you a traveling trailer to outfit with a collection from the museum that you could send around the state. What a fabulous gift. I mean, I thought, mm -hmm, well, I really want to do this. And then when I started to look at it, I realized it was going to cost the museum, realistically, about $300,000 a year to do that. I couldn't even afford to pay some of the employees at the time. So I had to make a conscious decision about taking care of first things first. And now we're at a point where it's a bit easier and we can begin to extend the resources out further. But that, that's what I would, how I would answer that question. Carrie Dugan, John and Lucy, I just applaud your passion and your, your and just what an outstanding job I think both of you have done. What, what a contribution to the city, first of all. My question is, I'm curious what, what initiatives or what, what programs between Portland Public Schools and the museum may be in place? What joint efforts? Um, what, what are you doing? What, can, what further can be done to immerse our youth, our children in the museum and just to, to really uh, you know, expose them and, and immerse them? Well, the, the young audience, the children's audience, is in many respects what we are all about because that is planting seeds for a new cultural generation. And the reason why I'm sitting here today is because as a child, my parents took me to the Children's Museum in Nashville, Tennessee, and that is why I'm in front of you right now. And I know that it can open vistas onto the world that we've never imagined. Um, it, it is uh, tedious, but hopefully will uh, be, become easier. Um, for a while, uh, just before I arrived and shortly into my arrival, we had some sort of uh, rather formal arrangement with the Portland Public Schools for the bringing of students. But as their resources began to uh, be constricted, uh, that more formal relationship evaporated. And uh, what we realized is to share the museum physically, the, the presence, the exhibitions, the collections with uh, the student public, that it was necessary for us to assist in trying to find as much uh, transportation money, uh, bus money, scholarship money as we possibly can. And, and so that is really what one of the things that we've tried to do is to provide schools with money to bring their students to the Portland Art Museum. I hate paying bus companies, but if that's what it takes, that's what we've tried to do. Uh, you must know that it can't be a universal situation and that it's as we can uh, help schools afford it. Uh, for some of our exhibitions, we uh, have gone, and what we're trying to do now is to go to corporations or potentially interested donors in varying parts of the state and ask them if they won't uh, supply the money or the transportation necessary to bring, let's say, from Ashland or Medford, uh, the students in their area. And that has been very, very successful. I mentioned we had 60,000 visitors, 60,000 young visitors last year, and many of those were from outside the Portland area. So it's really a catch-as-catch-can situation. Uh, given uh, the unfolding of the museum over the next eight months, um, our staff uh, and I have been trying to 
to talk to groups such as yourselves about a number of different topics. And tomorrow afternoon, we're having a two-hour meeting with educators, principals, and, and superintendents at uh, secondary and primary from around the state here at the museum to talk to them about gosh, here are the artistic and historic treasures that are available to your students. How can we work together to deliver them? I don't know any way else to do it than to, than to talk to, to them. And so uh, I believe that we have the superintendent of Pe Portland Public Schools uh, coming for a really hands-on session for a couple of hours tomorrow afternoon. Lucy, anything you want to say about that? Students? Well, the only other thing would be that we are going to, in our new facility to have a new technology resource room. Right and we were able to get it funded, which I'm really pleased about, and it will provide the programming money so that we can actually begin building a virtual museum here at the museum. So you can be sitting in one part of the museum and tour our Japanese uh, collections and be able to click on an object, learn more about it. And so this will be a great way for students outside of, of our immediate region to be able to have a museum experience. Great, thank you, I would, I would encourage that, yeah, thank you. I'm sorry we don't have time for any more questions. Again, thanks very much. Wonderful presentation, and we'll see you. Thanks. We're adjourned. <laughs>